God's ways are so far above our ways as the heavens are above the earth. The synthesis of the gospel is Jesus himself at the end, forever. You and I will be in heaven or hell, period. Heavenly Father, we come in Jesus' name to consider the great mystery of the Catholic family, great mystery of holiness. We ask you to grant us the grace to delve into this mystery. We ask you to open our minds and hearts that we might come to appreciate the family, the sacrament of holy matrimony. For we know that this is the basic building block of all society. And if the family is sick, society is sick. And so we ask you in Jesus' name to grant us grace, to grant us grace to know and to love this great mystery of the Catholic family. And together we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. O Mary, conceived without sin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Happy are you who fear the Lord, who walk in his ways, your wife shall be like a fruitful vine in the recesses of your home. Your children like olive plants around your table. Behold, thus is the man blessed who fears the Lord. Those words from the psalm point toward the great holiness, the great gift uh, of the family. I've been asked to talk about the family this weekend, and so I'm going to break it down into six talks. Uh, the first one this evening will be on the nature and mission of the Catholic family. Uh, the next one will be on sex, of all things. Sex, sacred, not evil. Now that's an enormously relevant and necessary topic. Very few priests, I believe, talk about it. Uh, maybe they don't want to, they're uncomfortable with it, they don't think it's relevant, I'm not sure. But it is important. Uh, and I can tell you, I can tell you how important it is by how messed up society is, right? You, I mean, you can deduce that. You know the kind of problems we have in that area in our society. Um, but it, it's sacred. It's not dirty, it's not evil, it's not something bad. The contrary. It's sacred. The third talk will be on the sanctity of human life. That will be based mostly on the encyclical Humanae Vitae of Pope Paul VI. The sanctity of human life. Human life is sacred from the moment of conception to the last moment of natural life. Contemporary attacks on the family will be the fourth talk, and there are many of them, not the least of which, by the way, is the current tidal wave of scandals in the church. The attacks on the priesthood from within and from without, that's an attack on the family. You know why? Because the sanctification of the family is very much dependent upon the ministry of priests. I'll tell you what's happened. By my own experience, when I traveled with a, a man or men to help me, they said I was a homosexual. When I travel with a woman to help me, they say it must be his mistress. God forbid I should ever travel with young people or children or 
God knows what they think. I live with two Chesapeake Bay Retrievers. <laughs> you know what? I don't care what they think. Doesn't make a bit of difference to me what they think. But that's how absurd it is. And I'll tell you, I, you know, I try to be, treat it lightly, and we've got to laugh about it a little bit, but it's tragic. Absolutely tragic. Think about this for a minute. Now, how many of you were here last summer when I was here? Oh, quite a few of you. For, for the Immortal Combat, the, the series we did right here on spiritual warfare. Think what's happened. Now, remember, I did that in July last year. Think what's happened since then. Been one heck of a year, hasn't it? Who would have known a couple months later? Less than two months later, September 11th. Then a tidal wave of scandals. In the church, outside of the church. Enron, WorldCom, Arthur Anderson, and who knows what's next. Of all the priests who helped me advance toward priesthood, of all of them, there's only one left who isn't dead or permanently expelled from the priesthood. Only one left. He celebrates his 50th anniversary of ordination next week. I'll preach the homily at the Mass. I could tell you the names, the very prominent names, of some wonderful priests. My mother sent me a newspaper clipping last week. She called me first to tell me about it. Her voice was trembling on the phone. The headline from the diocesan newspaper, my home diocese, Albany, New York. Seven priests removed from ministry forever. That was the headline, forever. Forever. You cannot appreciate what that means unless you understand what a priest is and what he means to your family. Contemporary attacks on the family. That'll be number four. Number five, love equals sacrifice. A lot of you have heard me say that before. Love is the cross, and the cross is love. Most of you are married. You know about that. You know that after the honeymoon, it's sacrifice. Hmm? You know, one day you wake up, bleary-eyed look over, and exclaim, Ah! What have I done? You're married, bozo. <laughs> Too late now. But that's when love begins to mature. Tested love is true love. And so after the hormone stage and the emotion stage and the honeymoon stage passes, authentic love matures. And in the end, it equals sacrifice. That's the fifth talk. And then at the end, we'll have a question and answer. We'll. Uh, probably pass around some notepads or something and write some brief questions that you want to ask me concerning the topic, you know, on, on this discussion on the family. I, I entitled it The Catholic Family Garden of Holiness. And the Catholic family is exactly that, or should be that, a garden of holiness. 
Many of you have heard me give a talk on the Blessed Mother on the Immaculate Heart of Mary, and I talk about the Immaculate Heart of Mary in the context of a garden, a holy garden. The Catholic family is a garden of holiness. The Catholic family is a place set aside for the planting and the nurturing and the bringing to fruition of virtue. All virtues should be planted, nurtured, cultivated, and brought to fruition in the garden of the Catholic family, a garden of holiness. I wonder, just think about this for a minute. Now, I know that you folks are not your average Catholic. You're not. Um, you may think you are, but you're not. Uh, you, I know you don't think of yourself this way, but you're the cream of the crop. You really are. You're the pillars of the church. You're the people who century in and century out keep the church going. You are the people who will still be here when this rash of scandals blows away. You'll still be standing not going to shake you. Oh, it shakes our faith a little bit. We struggle with this mess. I do. But you're going to be here. When the storm blows itself out, you're going to be here. You're rock solid. I know that. But you need to be confirmed in your faith, just like I do. I, I know I can't tell you anything new, but what I can do is confirm you in what you already have. Convince you that you haven't made a mistake. That the faith of our fathers is the faith indeed. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And now we need to be stronger than ever. We need strong families. All vocations come from the family. Vocations are the fruit that comes from the Garden of Holiness, Catholic family. Whether it's vo vocations to marriage, vocations to the priesthood, vocations to religious life, all vocations flow from the family. If the family is not what it should be, individuals will be deformed stunted, blighted. Do you remember what happened when Jesus and the disciples were walking through the countryside and Jesus wanted to take some figs from the fig tree and there weren't any and he cursed the fig tree? They said, well, let, let us, let us uh, put some manure on it and and cultivate it a little bit and give it a chance. Wait, wait a while. You know, it, it might bear fruit yet. He came back by and it hadn't borne fruit. What did he do? He cursed it, withered and died. Is your family bearing fruit? Now, when I ask you that question, don't panic. Because everybody I know, every good Catholic family that I know, has some members who aren't practicing the faith. I'm, I'm not talking about that. Don't, don't panic when I say that. Most people do. You know, they say, oh, uh oh. I'm the, uh, you know, I'm the cursed fig tree. No. <laughs> no figgy. Don't worry. You're all right. Sometimes you can do everything right, and it looks like you've failed. It's not over yet, though. You know, God's not finished with your children or your grandchildren just yet. You have time, and so long as there's time, there's hope. God can do more in a minute than a thousand years of mere human effort. And so don't despair. Don't worry. 
But don't be foolish either. Get to work. Get to work and pray. The sacrament of matrimony, of course, is the basis for the, the family. That's where holy families come from. Matrimony is a, a sacrament. It's an interesting sacrament. It's the only sacrament where the recipients of the sacrament are the ministers of the sacrament. Did you know that? Did most of you know that? Some of you know that. How many of you have studied the Catechism of the Catholic Church? Seriously. See, now I'm talking to the pillars of the church here. And, and you are. And I respect you for that. But you know what? You better get to work. Because as much as I love you, if you don't study the Catechism, now here's my Walmart version of it. I got this in Walmart for $3.95. They had an enormous mountain of them in Walmart, of all places. It says $7.99 on the back. I got it for $3.95. I know how to shop. <laughs> now, if you don't have a copy of this, shame on you. But you say, but I'm too old, Father. How old are you, 90? I have men and women, many of them in their 80s, that went through my entire course on the Catechism of the Catholic Church. They sat there personally through all 48 hours of it and the 12 hours of question and answer when I filmed it back in 1996. Countless more have watched it on television or through the videotapes, parishes, adult education groups and parishes, little groups meeting in somebody's home studying the Catechism. Why should you study the Catechism of the Catholic Church? Because basically it's the truth. What's the truth? The truth is Jesus. Jesus is the truth. Do you think we should study Jesus? Do you think do you, think you should know the person you love? Yeah. I mean, it's absurd to say I love somebody and not to, you don't want to know anything about them. Silly. Jesus is the truth. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You, you've got to get to know Jesus. You've got to get to know the Lord. And one of the best ways to do it is to study the faith, because the substance of the faith is Jesus Christ, the truth. Study it. Learn it. Interiorize it. And then live it. And you'll be a force. St. Thomas Aquinas used to say, an error in the beginning is an error indeed. I think the biggest error that we make in families, and I think it's built into the system, I, I, I can't criticize it too much. It's just a fact of life. When you're younger, you have other things on your mind, maybe starting a career, uh, you're ambitious, uh, whatever it is, and you do not take your faith that seriously. You do not spend, I can, I can tell you how you gauge it. On an average day, how much time do you dedicate to prayer? Now, I know you don't have that much time. You've got to work. You've got to do all kinds of things. You're not nuns or monks. You're not supposed to be. You're lay people. But ask yourself an honest question. Out of 24 hours in a day, do I give the Lord at least 30 minutes? How about 15? You've got to do at least that much. You know what's going to happen if you don't do at least that much? Nothing's going to happen. That's what's going to happen. You're going to go downhill. There are no planes in the spiritual life. You go up or you go down. It's a very steep hill. You climb or you roll back down. No planes, no flat places in the spiritual life. The clock is ticking. About a month ago, well, June 11th, I remember the date when I was laying on that table and the guy said, I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do for you. 
I didn't panic, but I got more serious than usual. <laughs> you know what I mean. Oh, yeah, I packed my suitcase. I gathered up my medical records. I went off to do what I had to do. And uh, that morning, you know, I, got, I went to bed, got in about 10 o'clock at night, it went to my friend's house, slept there, didn't sleep much that night. Um, the next, it was a busy day. I had this appointment scheduled with the cardiologist and then the surgeon, and, uh, you know, I was going to have the, sur the surgery then, the next morning. You know what the first thing I did was on that, um, I guess it was a Thursday morning? I said, uh, I want to go to confession. I went to the local parish, waylaid the priest in the courtyard, said, Father, I'd like to go to confession. And I told him I was about to have serious surgery. And I said, Bless me, Father, for I have sinned. And then he gave me anointing of the sick. And, it, and then everything went better from that point on. I scurried around. I had to finish writing my will. Then I had my doctor meetings. But you know what I did first. Like I said last year, if you can't even get to the battlefield, how are you going to fight the fight? If you're not in a state of grace, now I was in a state of grace, by the way, but I went to confession anyway. Why? You don't want to take no chances. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> hey, uh, my friend, the nurse, was, was uh, trying to lighten things up all day, and she said, Well, Father, <laughs> she said, When you wake up, you'll see me over you saying, It's over, Father. Everything's all right now. You get serious when you're facing that stuff. If we could be serious every day of our life, when the last day of our life came along, it'd go a lot easier on us. It really would. Well, I have some advice for you. Right here and right now, get serious. When I stood up here last year, one year ago, Who among us would have thought what would transpire in that year between then and now? God help us. September 11th? My dad died a few days before that. I buried my father on September 11th, by the way. I flew down to Los Angeles from San Francisco September 10th. met my superior. We went, stayed in a motel, got up 5 o'clock in the morning to celebrate Mass. My office manager called me about 5.30 Pacific time and said, turn on the television, something horrible is going on. And I saw the events live. This last year has been unbelievable. Now, I told you to get serious last year. And I'm telling you again, get serious. Get serious in your personal life. Get serious in your family life. Because God only knows what's going to happen in this coming year. And it's not going to get any better until it gets a lot worse. In the last year, we've had September 11th, we've had Enron, we've had WorldCom, we've had Arthur Anderson. What's next? The world is coming apart at the seams. Our society is unraveling. The decline in the stock market is unnerving. I have friends who've lost millions this past year. I wonder what will happen 
in the coming year. What is the mission of the Catholic family? The mission of the Catholic family can be no different than the mission of the Redeemer. What is the mission of the Redeemer? Redemption. Why did Jesus come? To save the world. The mission of the family is sanctification. The sanctification of the members of the family is the mission of the family. And then the members of the family go out into the world and set about the work of sanctifying that world. Jesus said and says, the servant is no better than his master. Where I am there, my servant will be. Redemption. Sanctification. The bottom line is this, souls, period. End of story. You can simplify it. We don't have to complicate a simple thing. Simplify a complicated thing, but this is a simple thing. Tell it simply. Why are we here? To become holy. What is the purpose of the family? That the members of the family might become holy. Why? Because that is the mission of Christ. But you cannot do until you are. There's an axiom in met metaphysics. Being precedes doing. Being precedes doing. Jesus is God and Son of God. A divine person who assumed a human nature. And then through that perfectly holy human nature, he sanctified the world. He made it holy. That is our mission. And if you are doing anything other than that as the overall objective of your life, you're wasting your time. You really are. If the objective of our life is to make as much money as we can, that's a great deception. That's a great waste of time for me and for you. You know, if I come to the end and stand before God, do you think God is going to ask for a set of audited financial statements? Not from Arthur Anderson, he won't. <laughs> By the way, I had a job offer from Arthur Anderson when I was right out of college. I'm glad I didn't take it. I could be a partner right now <laughs> with all my stock and my pension plan worthless. God help us, the poor people. We're losing confidence in the government. We're losing confidence in corporate America. Uh, I've lost confidence in the medical system, the health care system. <laughs> You know, I'm not going to panic about it, but, uh, you know, I'm interviewing lawyers now. Yeah, I hate to do that, but you know what? <laughs> there are hospitals and doctors, just as there are other professionals, other people, who are doing unethical and immoral things for money. Uh, just like creative accounting can result in a deceptive presentation of the financial situation of a corporation. Take somebody like me. I'm 55. You know, that, that's an interesting age, right? 55. Now, I'm a senior cer citizen, you know, in certain circles now. 55. My dad died of coronary artery disease, the onset of which was when he was about 55. I don't eat right, I don't exercise anymore, I have way too much stress in my life. So when the doctor said, look, you need a triple bypass, I was shocked but not surprised. And so, I would have gone right through it had I not been the beneficiary of a lot of prayers. I'm sure of that. 
I didn't go to the other state to get a second opinion. I went to have the surgery. I was just fortunate that they checked everything out first. There is decadence every place you look. I can't get through a day without this much aggravation. I don't know about you. I get my telephone bill. It's wrong. <laughs> I get a credit card bill. Who did that? <laughs> you go to the doctor. Nobody knows. I got three board certified cardiologists over here saying I'm on the edge of death. I got three board certified cardiologists over here say, oh, you're the picture of health. <laughs> What'd I do? Flip a coin? <laughs> I'll guarantee you. All of the people in corporate America, the medical profession, the legal profession, the priesthood, whatever, who are skipping and dancing down the wrong road, aren't living the values that a Catholic and Christian family taught them or should have taught them. An error in the beginning is an error indeed as St. Thomas said. My brothers and sisters, you and I have an awesome responsibility. You've got to form your children and your grandchildren. That's a daunting task. Look at the world we live in. It's corrupt. Every place you look, it is sick. It is decadent. But you can't become bitter and cynical and negative because that doesn't work. You have to transcend that. You have to have confidence. You have to have courage. You have to have every virtue. And those virtues are initially cultivated in the Catholic family, a garden, a garden of holiness. You need to do that. Mom, Dad, Grandma, Grandpa, you're awesome. You're tremendous. You are called to a mighty, dignified, and noble undertaking. The sanctification of your family. And I'm called to sanctify all of you. And boy, don't you think that doesn't scare the tar out of me. I might have to answer for your souls. Oh, I will. I'll guarantee you I will. I'm going to have to stand before Jesus and explain why some of you slipped through my fingers because of my negligence, because of my worldliness, because of my lack of focus, because I didn't shed enough blood, sweat, and tears because I wasn't assiduous enough in prayer and penance, because I wasn't a good soldier staying at my post on the battle line when my mission demanded it of me, when I wanted to take my ease. It's an awesome responsibility for me and for you. Time is short. I'm not talking about the end of the world. I know nothing about that. I am talking about an escalation, an intensification of things in the world. And if you have eyes to see and ears to hear, you know I'm right. Look at the last year since we've been together. What's transpired? Probably some of us didn't make it through this year. God only knows that I've had several points during this year where I didn't think I could go on another step. It, it, it's like being, it's like a, a boxer being in a fight. I feel like I fought a 15-round fight this past year 
with someone way out of my class, and I took a real fearsome beating. I have been engaged in lawsuits, in medical fiascos. I have been accused of things that you wouldn't believe. I have spent $100,000 in legal and medical bills in the last 90 days. I don't have that much money. And it's going to take me a while to get out of that mess. I will. I will. 90 days. And I didn't have the stinking surgery. <laughs> It'd be another 350 to 500,000 if I had. Now I wonder how many other poor souls have had it. When I was talking to the FBI agent in that region about it, I reminded them that 4 to 7 percent of people who have triple bypasses die within 90 days. I wonder how many unnecessary surgeries were done, and I wonder how many people are in that 4 to 7 percent. I wonder how many second degree murder charges we could bring because somebody was greedy. Across the board, we live in a sick, depraved, immoral, unethical society. And it is our fault. It is the fault of Catholics and Catholic families because we have failed to be as holy as we are called to be. We get what we deserve. My next door neighbor yesterday we were having a glass of iced tea together, and he had open-heart surgery a couple years ago, and we were comparing bills. <laughs> Mine was small, and his was big. And he was lamenting the fact that he remembered the days where, when a woman could deliver a baby, and it cost 50 bucks. Or you could spend a week in the hospital for about 300 <laughs> it, it, it's amazing that in my lifetime, we've gone from that to $75 for an aspirin on your hospital bill. Well, they have to pay a pharmacist, they say, etc., etc. There's something wrong. There's something very, very wrong. Well, what do we do? Just complain about it or do we do something about it? We do something about it. And it starts in the family. The family. The family is being undermined, ridiculed, mocked. Women and men tell me all over the country that if they have more than two children, uh, they begin to wonder if they're in communist China because people criticize them. Tomorrow, most of the day will be spent on topics concerning life, the sanctity of human life. I blame an awful lot of what we have on the self-centeredness that was fostered, promoted, and perpetuated through a contraceptive mentality. We became focused on self, sexually, Financially, in every other way, followed. If you're centered on yourself, you're going to unravel. You're going to close in on yourself. And then society will do the same. But what is society if it is not a community of individuals? And if all those individuals are empty, cold, and self-centered, then what can we expect but disaster? Whenever we talk this way, we open ourselves to criticism. Oh, he's negative. He's bitter. He's cynical. He's pessimistic. No. I am realistic. It is the truth. And if you and I don't begin in earnest, then we will live to see our children and grandchildren inherit a legacy of emptiness 
that will be absolutely terrifying. The Catholic family has to have a resurgence. We have to become extremely serious about safeguarding the integrity and the sanctity of our family. Now, I have never been a parish priest, but if I were a parish priest, and I don't have the gifts for it, I admit, but if anything threatened my parish, bad teaching, a bad teacher, some kind of immorality, God help it. Because metaphorically speaking, I'd rip it limb from limb. It wouldn't get far in my bailiwick. And in the family, you have to be just as assiduous in maintaining an environment that is wholesome and holy. And I know it's not easy, and it takes some ingenuity. And you don't want to be a, a Hitler about it. You don't want to be a dictator about it. You don't want to alienate your children. But you have to be strong. And you have to be clear-headed. Soft-hearted, yes but not soft-headed. You've got to be strong as parents and as spouses. In the end, you'll suffer. You'll suffer. You don't believe me, then tomorrow or the next day when you go home, announce to your family that each evening after supper, you're going to pray the family rosary. And if you don't think you'll suffer, watch what happens. And if you don't get it right away, wait a week or a month and see how many contrivances arise, rise their ugly heads to end the little ro rosary gathering. Some of you have heard me tell the story about my great-grandfather, the French-Canadian one on my mother's side. Great-grandfather was a carpenter. And um, we'd go up and visit him once in a while. He was a very powerfully built man, but not big. Short, about five foot seven, high and wide at the shoulder. And every evening, without fail, for his entire married life, which spanned 65 years before he passed on, he led his family in the family rosary great-grandfather would kneel on a chair and there he had he was a carpenter and he carved a beautiful statue out of wood hardwood of the blessed mother of the sacred heart of jesus and saint joseph and they were indented into the wall and he would kneel down on that chair and the whole family would kneel behind behind him and great-grandfather would lead the whole family young and old, in the family rosary. You did not know great-grandfather. I only knew him as a small boy. But you couldn't imagine to have announced to great-grandfather, I don't feel like doing it tonight. You have no idea what that would have elicited. For great-grandfather was a formidable man even in his old age. When the children and the grandchildren came to visit, didn't make any difference. Some of them had been in the Marines. Some of them came home in their Marine uniforms. Every one of them in their Marine uniforms knelt down and said the family rosary. Or they didn't want to reckon with great-grandfather. That's a family. That's a Catholic family. We have a crisis in the family. We have a crisis of manhood. A lot of men don't know what it means to be men anymore. They are weak in the knees, got no moral backbone, interested in all kinds of sundry and irrelevant things, don't have a clue that their main function is the sanctification of their family, their wife, and their children. And the women? What's your job? I think women are better at it than men. They always have been. But the women, their job? Sanctify the husband and the children. The children, what's their job? Sanctify the parents. 
They usually do it by torturing them. <laughs> no. <laughs> Not really. Not really. But no, everybody has a job. And the job is the same. Holiness. Sanctification of the family. You're to provide an environment where virtue flourishes. That means an environment where impurity has no place. That means a wholesome environment. That means an open environment. That means an environment where your children can approach you. Not in fear, but in openness and in love. You know, it's a great art to balance justice and mercy. That's what God does. He's a God of justice, but he's also a God of mercy, and in the end, mercy triumphs over justice. Be soft-hearted. You were young once. You know what it was like. If you've forgotten, recall. Don't be too tough on them, but don't be soft-headed. They want to do things that you know from your own experience, you know can lead to trouble, don't be afraid to say no. My mother, every now and then, reminisces about a day not too long after when I got out of the Army, 1970, in the early spring. No, it wasn't the spring. No, it was later. It was in the fall of 1970. And my little sister had just turned 14 and entered high school. And she asked my mother, starting on Monday, if she could go to the football game Friday night. And my mother said, yes, you can go to the football game, but you can't go in a car. I don't want you going in a car with older kids. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you know how it is, kept it up and kept it up. Friday morning, my mother left for work, as usual, at 6.30. Again, I want to go to the football game. I want to go with my friends. My mother said, no, you can go to the game, but not in a car. If you go in a car, something terrible will happen. My little sister snuck off in the car with her friends. And on the way home from the game, they were all killed. Except the driver. He had to live with it for the rest of his life. Four of them, 14 to 16, snuffed out. Now my mother had said no, because she had a sense that only a mother can have. There was a reason for it. God has his reasons that reason cannot fathom. Parents, be loving, but be strong. You don't want to ever be caught in the position like the woman who went to Padre Pio, the great saint, went to confession, knelt down, and she couldn't even get the first word out. He leaped up and chased her out of the confessional. She was very much indignant about it, came back later and chastised him, said, why did you chase me out of the confession like, confessional like that? He said, because when you knelt down, I had a vision of your three children, every one of whom is in hell because of your negligence and permissiveness. Now confess and be forgiven. Brothers and sisters, it is an awesome, enormous dignity to be a husband, wife, member of a family, remembering that the family is a microcosm of the church and that the family is the domestic church. The first line of catechesis it is where that garden of holiness has to be planted. It's where we nurture the seeds of virtue, where those seeds flourish.
and bear fruit, where the members of that family go out into society and enrich it, strengthen it, ennoble it. That's the family. That's the Catholic family. And if you want to know why the family is unraveling, I can point to last summer's conference. Spiritual warfare. The enemy is a tactician. Strike the family, you strike at all of society. Undermine the family, you undermine all of society. Let's be resolved, family. Let's be resolved, no matter how young or old we are, to enter into this battle for the family with all our heart, mind, and strength. Because I promise you, if you do that, if you do it faithfully, in a little while, a very little while, sooner than you think, you and I are going to be standing before God. And he's going to smile at you. And you're going to hear these words. Well done. My good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master's house. God bless you. The earth. The synthesis of the gospel is Jesus himself at the end forever you and i will be in heaven or hell period okay last night we talked about the nature and mission of the catholic family the nature of the catholic family is holiness okay holy the family is called to be holy the mission of the catholic family Holiness, sanctity, the mission of the Redeemer. You can't give what you don't have. Priests in the old days learned a Latin expression, nemo dat quod non habit. You cannot give what you do not have. Being precedes doing. Your very essence precedes action. You've got to be before you do. You have to become Christ before you do the works of Christ. You understand that principle? You learn principles, you learn. You've got to learn principles. Being precedes doing. In order to do the works of Christ, that's what we're called to, right? We're the members of the body of Christ. We're called to do the works of Jesus. Jesus said the, the servants know no better, no different than his master. You have to become Christ. That's holiness. That's a function of prayer. That's a function of the sacramental life of the church. That's a function of virtue. Okay? You have to become the living presence of Christ. And then you're capacitated, you're enabled to do the works of Christ. That's the principle. Okay? What's the, the essence, the nature, the work of the family? The same as that of Christ the same as each individual member of the family. You've got to become holy, and then you will diffuse that holiness. You can't give what you do not have. We're going to talk now in this session about sex. We should have the media here. <laughs> right? They'd love it, right? You, you can go home and tell all your friends, I went to a conference and Father Croppy talked about sex. I'll be getting called into the bishop's office, probably. Well, you have to. My goodness, you know. Uh, and, and, and you don't have to be ashamed about it or afraid of it. It's absolute reality, right? And nowadays, it's in your face every place you look. What's the church's teaching on it, though? How should we think? I entitled it Sex, Sacred, Not Evil. It's not dirty. It's not bad. It's part of God's plan. It's part of God's creation. But you have to understand the context in which it is. You have to understand why. What's it for? I can tell you what it's not for. It's not 
a sport. Hmm? It's not merely a recreational activity. It's not merely something to do. It is sacred. Now, let me try to, in a simple way, tell you what it is. It's a gift, first of all. Okay? Sexuality and the expression thereof is a gift given by God to humanity. The exercise of that gift is the prerogative of married persons. In the context, the sacred context, I, I, I want to emphasize that word, the sacred context of a sacrament called matrimony. You know, from the very beginning, from creation, the book of Genesis, says God created them, male and female. He created them. Absolutely equal in dignity, he created them, but not the same did he create them. Equal in dignity, but not the same. Equal in dignity as persons. Men are no more noble or dignified than women, and women are no more noble or dignified than men. Equal in dignity, nobility, beauty before God, but not the same. Out of our, how could I say it, out, out of the differences, you know, you have men and women. Out of your nature flows certain responsibilities, certain things you do. I've often uh, explained this. Some of you have heard me talk about, uh, I'll never be a mother. Profound statement, right? I mean, I'll, I'll ne I happen to think maternity, motherhood, is one of the greatest gifts imaginable. A, a mother, it's hard to imagine a greater vocation than that. You know, beautiful. And I, ha I have the highest regard for mothers, but I'll never be one. But should I be put out? Should I be upset? Should I cry foul? No. Why can't I be a mother? Because it does not flow from my nature. It's not proper. Only women can be mothers. Well, does that mean that men are inferior? No. It just means that they're different. And out of those differences flow complementary dimensions. Male and female, he created them. In the context of that sacrament, that sacred thing, the man and the woman come together in that, in that sacrament. Now what happens, what is sexuality? Well, when it's expressed in marital love, there are two essential dimensions, and they can never be artificially separated and remain in the grace and goodness of God. The unitive and the procreative. Two dimensions. The unitive, that concerns the love of the spouses for each other. Husband and wife have an interchange of love. And, and I'll tell you, you have to go right back to the fundamental truth of our faith, the Trinity, in order to understand this theologically and philosophically. There is one God. That one God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you know how the persons of the Trinity are are said to be. From all eternity, the Father loves the Son. From all eternity, the Son loves the Father. From all eternity, the exchange, the mutual exchange of love between the Father and the Son, as we say in theology, spirates or breathes forth 
the Holy Spirit, personified love. Now, in that mystery of the Trinity is wrapped up the mystery of marital love. The husband and the wife, in a sense mirroring the love of the Trinity, express that love in a mutual exchange that's emotional, that's physical, and that is even spiritual. It is a high, noble, and beautiful thing. Together, expressing their love, they enter into a sacred place, a sanctuary called the creative dimension. God the creator. Now man and wife, husband and wife, together, are allowed to enter into the holy of holies of God's creative love, and they procreate, right? Mom and dad, together, mutual exchange of love, mirroring God's love. What happens? New life. That is not a small thing. We tend to trivialize that. We are not very high thinkers in general. We take it for granted. We just look at it biologically. Listen, we're not mere animals. We are not merely animals. Yes, we have a biological dimension, a physical dimension, sure. But much more, much more than that. You have to understand that sexuality is a gift and it is sacred. It is often, however, profaned. Do you understand what profanation is? Let me explain it for you very simply. Profanation, and I could use the word sacrilege too, uh, synonymously. Profanation is to take something holy and reduce it to profane use. I'll give you an example. We, we celebrated Mass this morning. And you know, at Mass, you have the sacred vessels, the chalice and the paten, right? And we, we put wine in the chalice and the host bread on the paten, and then at the words of consecration, that bread and wine is changed in substance into the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. Now, those vessels are called sacred, sacred vessels. When they are consecrated, they are consecrated for sacred use. The word consecrated means set aside. Do you know that that comes from the same Greek word, hagios, for holiness or sacred? The patent and the chalice, in the old days, only a bishop could consecrate or bless the patent and the chalice. Now any priest can do that. But basically what it is, they, the, the prayer is a consecratory prayer. It sets aside those vessels for sacred use. In other words, you don't drink beer out of the chalice. That would be a profanation, sacrilegious. It's set aside for sacred use. From the time those sacred vessels are consecrated or made sacred, they're set aside for sacred use alone. That means they're used at Mass, and that's the only thing they can be used for, and any other use would be, would be a profanation of that which is sacred. Do you understand that at baptism you are consecrated, you are set aside, you are made holy, and that sin is a profanation of that which is holy. St. Paul said, do you not understand that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? Act accordingly. Now at marriage, the sacrament of matrimony, there's a consecration, there's a setting aside. It's a very interesting and unique sacrament. <clears throat> it's the only sacrament where the ministers of the sacrament are the individuals receiving the sacrament. No other sacrament like that. 
husband and wife, the spouses, minister to each other. They exchange consent. They give themselves to each other. And it's permanent. From that moment, they are capacitated to enter into the sanctuary of God's creative love, and they are the only ones who have that blessing, that gift, that privilege. I don't, and never will. But married people do. You have that gift. You have that privilege, and it's a noble one, a high one, a beautiful one. Sex is sacred. And the use of the sexual faculty can only be legitimately, licitly used inside the sacred context of marriage. Any other use of the sexual faculty is outside God's plan outside God's grace, outside God's love. It doesn't mean God doesn't love you. God doesn't stop loving people who offend him. God loves the sinner. God hates the sin. Why? Because the sin hurts the one he loves. Okay? Please understand that. An enormous amount of damage has been done to the faith through the years by the erroneous thinking that God somehow stops loving the sinner. Mm -mm. No, God loves the sinner, but God doesn't love the sin which separates his child from him. If I love you, and I do, as my spiritual family, if you would, God forbid, uh, contract AIDS or cancer, I wouldn't stop loving you. I might even love you more. And if I had the heart and mind of Christ in my love, I would desire to alleviate your suffering. I don't like the cancer, though. I hate the AIDS that's eating you alive. I love you. I don't love the disease. And that's the way it is, the differentiation between the sinner and sin. So, husband and wife, having made a vow to each other, having ministered a sacrament to each other, remember this, in marriage you have ministered a sacrament. It might be the only sacrament married people ever minister. Usually it is. You know, it's possible you could minister another sacrament. You could be the ministers of baptism in a case of necessity, right? Yeah, anybody, anyone can baptize in case of, of grave necessity, but usually that doesn't happen. But when you got married, you ministered a sacrament. You didn't only receive a sacrament. You ministered a sacrament to each other. And from that moment on, you were given that power, that grace, that gift, that capacity to enter into a very sacred place, the place where God brings new life into existence. And so, having made a vow to each other that goes like this, everything that I am and everything that I do, I give to you. All that I am and all that I do is yours. That's the way it's supposed to be. That mutual exchange of love, that's in the heart, that's in the mind. And it is expressed physically. And that's the marital act. That's human sexuality. Every marital act, every conjugal act must be left open to the transmission of life, to retain its innate dignity and grace. The artificial separation of the unitive 
from procreative dimensions of the marital act is intrinsically evil. Let me say that again. And make sure you understand it. And if you don't understand anything I'm saying, don't feel bad about that. But write down a question. And I'm going to answer those questions this afternoon at the end. Two essential dimensions in the marital act, in sex. The unitive, that is where the two express their love for each other physically. That's the unitive. They come together. Love tends toward union. Secondly, the procreative, bringing new life into existence. You can't artificially separate them. That's artificial contraception. But then you say, oh, but we can't have another child. And I sympathize with that. There are good reasons why a couple can't have another child right now, maybe indefinitely. And the church understands and permits that. For a just reason, a grave reason, a good reason, not a trivial reason, a couple may defer conception of another child or a child even inde indefinitely, okay? There, there may be physical reasons, right? Sometimes it, it can be outright dangerous for a woman uh, to conceive and have a child. There are medical reasons for that. You, you probably know them better than I do, but it's true. So what do you do? I mean, they, they, I've had couples say, well, the doctor says if I have another child, it could jeopardize my health, my life. Do I have to, in order to be in, in tune with the church's teaching, do I have to conceive anyway? No, of course not. Of course not. Well, what do I do then? Can, can I take the pill? You know, can, can we use some other method of birth control? No. Well, what are you telling me then? It's called natural family planning. And it should be absolutely mandatory that every couple planning to get married know what it is, know how to use it. It should be taught routinely. That does not mean that you use it routinely. No, the norm is every marital act is left open to the transmission of life. Now, it's a biological fact that not every marital act will result in conception. We all know that. But it has to be left open. It cannot be artificially contracepted. Artificial contraception is intrinsically evil. Do you know what that term intrinsically evil means? It means in itself it's evil. You can't do it. Taking the life of an innocent person, that's intrinsically evil. No amount of circumstances can change that. I can't, now that doesn't mean that, that a person can't, or a nation can't defend itself. No, that's not an innocent person, an unjust aggressor. No, no, you can take action in self-defense to stop that, but that's not what we're talking about. An intrinsically evil act. For a Catholic in good conscience. Now, by the way, there are a large number of Catholics who have and who do use artificial contraception. More than half, supposedly. Is there a justification for it? No. No. Can you do it? No. Could I be wrong? No. I'd tell you if it were a questionable area. I would. But it is not. Now, many theologians will take the opposite position. They're wrong. They're dead wrong. The encyclical Humanae Vitae by Pope Paul VI, issued July 25, 1968, is a definitive document 
contrary to what some theologians believe and teach, it's a definitive document. Is it part of the doctrine of the faith? Yes. Must it be accepted? Yes. Is there any justification for not accepting it? No. And yet, bishops, priests, and theologians in many places throughout the last several years have rejected it, even put in writing that they rejected it. I was in Winnipeg, Canada, last year, on the very anniversary when the vast majority of Canadian bishops penned the infamous Winnipeg statement where they rejected the teaching of Humana Vitae, thus relegating themselves to disgrace. No artificial contraception. But there are cases where, for a serious reason, a couple may defer the birth of, or conception of another child, even indefinitely, okay? Natural family planning. I, I don't have time, and I'm not qualified to teach a course now on natural family planning, but there are people who are qualified and who do teach that. Doc, Dr. Uh, Janet Smith knows a lot more about a lot of these things than I do. That's her area of expertise, and I'm sure she'll talk about some of these things uh, in more detail. But the essence of what you've got to believe is that sex is not a trivial, mundane, profane, dirty, evil thing. That is not what Christianity and Catholicism teaches. On the contrary, it teaches that sexuality is a high, noble, beautiful gift given by God to his beloved children, but that it is to be used in a very well-defined environment. And that means the environment of marriage. And it is where a man and a woman Need I go into that? Where a man and a woman, not a man and a man, and not a woman and a woman. All right? Let me be real clear on that one. Now, that's a whole nother question. The question of alternative lifestyles, as they call it. That's one of the attacks on the family, which uh, don't let me forget to talk about that when I talk this afternoon on the contemporary attacks on the family. That's one of them. You know, and the moron legislators, and I didn't make a mistake <laughs> using that terminology, the idiots who try to put same-sex marriages into law are destroying society in the interest of political expediency. And make no mistake about it, it will be a large contributing factor to the demise of society as that happens. Now, that does not mean that these persons who have that sexual orientation are bad or evil. No. Uh, they, they may, for who knows what reason that they are that way, and you can't hate them, and you can't be prejudiced and bigoted and mean to them. But you've got to tell the truth. We've got to be pastoral. We've got to be kind. We've got to be merciful and charitable. But that does not mean confirm people in their sins. Okay? You've got to tell the truth in love. And that's merciful. That's charitable. And that's pastoral. And anything other than that is not. It is very often indifference or cowardice. And we don't want to be guilty of that. So, sex is sacred. Sex is not evil. Sacred, not evil. 
Nowadays, it seems very often that the dignity and the nobility of the sacrament of matrimony is played down, even demeaned. And those who are open to life are often attacked for that very reason. They are ridiculed. I, I have friends who have six, seven, eight, nine children. I, I saw some one couple down in Atlanta recently when I was preaching, and I've known them for a long time. And uh, I said, uh, how, how many now? Because every time I see them, it's more. And uh, she said, eight. You know, it's a young, young couple. And I said, eight, wow. And, and um, you know, it's like, I don't know, one every year and a half or so, I think, that, that it's been. Not everybody can do that. Not everybody can do that. Not everybody has to do that. But they have the grace to do it. They have the physical. They're very healthy. Uh, it doesn't damage their health. They're very emotionally um, strong and stable. And they're very spiritual, spiritual people. They are daily communicants. And they are so happy. They are so happy. We should thank God for people like that. Now, if for whatever reason, whether physical, emotional, whatever reason, even financial sometimes, you can't do that. Don't feel so bad. You do what God lets you do. When you do the best with what you can. You know, my mother had three children. You know, that that's what she could handle. That's what she could do. Okay. That's all right. But let's not demean the people who have more. The artificial contraception mentality is there for many reasons, not the least of which is it's the enemy's tool and design. But, you know, an interesting thing is they say, well, we have a population problem in the world, which, by the way, we don't. That's an apparent problem. But you have to understand, you know, let's say a woman decides to have no children and thinks she's doing a great thing for society by not bringing any more mouths to feed in. Well, then where are the scientists going to come from who solve the food problem? Where are the doctors going to come from? Where are the nuclear physicists going to come from? Where are the priests going to come from? In Europe, the birth rate is very low. In places like Germany, I think France, uh, Christians, Catholics, aren't having children. I think the birth rate's less than one in some of those places, the Netherlands. And the Muslim people, who haven't been perverted in their understanding of this basic teaching, they're having lots of kids. Guess who's going to own Europe soon? Hmm? Uh, it, it is not going to be Christians. <clears throat> Okay? That, that's something to think, not that they're bad people. I'm not saying that at all. But maybe they're smarter than some people. God's design is that we be fertile and multiply. That's the norm. Sexuality is a gift. It is sacred. It's not evil. It's good. Most people are called to be married. Most people are not called to be single. That's a very rare calling. It happens, but it's not the norm. Most people are not called to be priests. Most people are not called to be nuns. Most people are called to be married lay people. That is the norm. That is where the vast majority of the church's population are, in that particular state in life. 
we often talk about a vocations crisis nowadays. Uh, it's acute. We were talking about it this morning. We had a vocations crisis. We had a shortage of priests a couple years ago, and everybody knew it. And now uh, somebody told me there, I don't know what the number was, 70, 80 or so priests that have been removed in Michigan alone. There are hundreds that have been removed in recent months all over the nation. That's a vocations crisis made more critical. But I'll tell you where we got an another crisis in another state in life. We have a vocations crisis in the married state. A lot of people aren't getting married. They're living in sin. A lot of people who are married, more than half, are getting divorced. There you, there's another vocations crisis that you don't hear about very much. Subvert that vocation, that state in life, and you subvert, you subvert them all. Where does every religious and priestly vocation come from? The family. Is there a state in life you can think of that doesn't come from the family? No. Where do people come from? The family. Hmm? Everybody has a mom and a dad. The demise of the family, the traditional family, is the demise of society. The breaking down of the family is the breaking down of civilization. Families are of enormous importance. As the family is wholesome, united, and sanctified, so too will society and civilization be wholesome, unified, and sacred. You understand that? Please understand that. But what do we do about it? The preservation of the family is in the hands of the family. Nobody's going to save it from the outside. Families have to be strengthened. Now, priests can help to strengthen the family by teaching the family, by administering the sacraments to the family, by giving good example to the family. But think back. Now, many of you are as old as I am, or older. You've seen a lot. Now, I, I, I turned 55 this year. So I've seen the last 55 years' worth. Think about the changes that have taken place from when you were young to now. Think about the wholesomeness, the unity, and the sanctity of families when we were young compared to now. Now, there are still very good families, many of yours, I'm sure. But in general, I'm talking in general, the norm, okay? The average family. The average family is kind of 50 50, has been split by divorce. 50% or more of marriages end in divorce. Now, that's one of the attacks on the family, contemporary attack on the family. But what, what can we do about it? Family prayer. Remember Father Peyton, the Rosary Crusade? The family that prays together, stays together. Let me read from you from the Holy Father's encyclical, The Gospel of Life. Very important encyclical. By the way, you don't have to be some great scholar or highly educated to learn your faith. It's not rocket science. It really isn't. 
my, you know, somebody says, well, I don't have the gifts to understand it. Can you read? Now, anybody here who doesn't think they can do that, that's my one question to you. Are you able to read? <clears throat> Every now and then, rarely, somebody might say no. And then I direct them to my tapes. <laughs> you don't even have to be able to read to learn your faith nowadays, right? Now, let me read to you from this. And so you ought to read this. You ought to study the Catechism of the Catholic Church. You ought to study these key encyclicals. For you good family people, this is a conference on the family, you ought to read such documents as um, the Holy Father's uh, document, Familiaris Consortio. You ought to read this one, Evangelium Vitae. That's the gospel of life. Don't be put off by the Latin words. They're always translated. The document's not printed in Latin. You don't have to know that. It's in English. Okay? Within the people of life and the people for life, the family has a decisive responsibility. You are not irrelevant. You're not unimportant. You're the key. Strong families make for strong society. Strong families make for a strong country. The demise of the family is the demise of the country. The demise of civilization. And that's a fact. Don't doubt it. This responsibility flows from its very nature as a community of life and love, founded upon marriage and from its mission. What's the mission of the family? To guard, reveal, and communicate life. I can go back to the first talk last night and put this in. What's the mission of the family? Well, the mission of the family, according to the Holy Father, John Paul II, the mission of the family is to guard, reveal, and communicate love. Here it is a matter of God's own love of which parents are co-workers. Mom and dad, you are co-workers with God and God's own love. As it were, interpreters when they transmit life and raise it according to his fatherly plan. This is the love that becomes selfless, receptiveness, and gift. Within the family, each member is accepted, respected, and honored precisely because he or she is a person. And if any family member is in greater need, the care which he or she receives is all the more intense and attentive. Mom and Dad, in your love for each other, you mutually express that love in terms of that are even physical. The emotional, spiritual, deep love you have for each other is expressed at times physically. That is open to life. At times, life is conceived. You collaborate with God the Creator in bringing new life into existence. For that, your reward in heaven will be, on, it'll be beyond your wildest dreams. We take that for granted. Do not. Mom and Dad, for being faithful in your expression of love, collaborating with God the Father, in bringing new life into existence, giving God children. Do you know how, in a manner of speaking, how happy our father is when he receives a new child, when he creates a new child? Now, could God create that child by snapping his divine fingers? Yes. Could God create that child by thinking it into existence? Yeah, God can do anything. But does he do it that way? No. How does he do it? He only does it one way, through you. 
and he blesses you for your faithful collaboration in his work of creation. And your reward will be immense. Don't you ever forget that. The world won't tell you that, but the church is telling you that. That's a fact. That's the truth. And so every member of that family is treated with dignity and respect. Now, we struggle sometimes. How many, many, many times I've talked with moms and dads who said, oh, we have such trouble. Most of my kids don't go to church. Well, I sympathize with that. Most of my mother's kids didn't go to church either at a certain point. They all go to church now, but for a good long time they didn't, not a one of them. Now, my mother wasn't a bad person. She was a daily communicant. She was always faithful. What happened to us? Well, temporary insanity, perhaps. <laughs> huh? But she hung in there. She prayed the rosary every day. We all came back. Many parents say, Father, my son, my daughter is gay. And it breaks my heart. What should I do? You've got to love that child. What else am I going to talk? What does it say right here? Every member of the family is accepted, respected, and honored. Why? Because of their achievements? No. Precisely because he or she is a person. <clears throat> is a gay individual a person? Yes. Does their homosexuality change the reality of their personhood? No. Must they be respected? Yes. Must they be loved? Yes. My son is marrying a girl who isn't Catholic. My son, my daughter is marrying a person who isn't Christian. My son, my daughter is marrying a person who has no religion. What can I do? I, I often respond to that by saying, do you think there's any chance that your child doesn't know where you stand? <laughs> and, and the answer is universal. Oh, no, they know how I feel about it. Okay, then as long as that's in place, you can love them. Because you've been telling them for 20 years or more what do, how, how, what's right and what's wrong. As long as you have, and as long as there's no confusion on that, so what should I do? You know, the problem is I don't want to condone or countenance uh, an immoral uh, act. You know, they're getting married in the gazebo in the park. Well, that's not what you would desire. They know it. But what do you do? Shun them? Nope. Hate them? Oh, no. you got to love them. Is that an excuse to stop loving them? No. That's like the case I mentioned. If somebody gets sick, you don't stop loving them. Every member of the family is respected and loved and honored because they are a person. What is the basic dignity of a human being? Personhood. Every human being is a person created in the image and likeness of God. That's why we respect every person. It doesn't matter what their race is. It doesn't matter what color they are, what nationality they are. Why do we respect them? Because they're white? Because they're black? Because they're oriental? Because they're European? Because they're American? No. You respect them because they are a person made in the image and likeness of God, and that's why every member of the family is honored, precisely because they are a person. And the ones who are in trouble, hmm? the ones who are in greater need, the ones who are in greater sin, should receive even more intense love and care. Now that 
is easy to say, hard to do. Boy, that really takes some effort, doesn't it? It takes a lot of grace sometimes. A lot of grace. But God will provide. And so, the family. It is a garden of holiness. It is an environment that should be wholesome, pure, and holy. And in that environment, virtue flourishes. And out from out of that environment, the world is enriched and is enabled to follow God's eternal design for creation. As we are faithful to that, we are happy and we prosper. As we are unfaithful to that, we become miserable. And things start to unravel. We are at a decisive time in history. The devil, and I say that literally, not figuratively, you know me. The, the enemy of souls. The devil. Satan, the adversary. He's done his homework. He has subverted family life. And now every corner of society is sick. It is corrupt. Every profession, the corporate world, even inside the church, we have corruption, deception, and death. And it can all be traced back to the ills in the family. You've got to have strong families, wholesome families, courageous families, holy families. And from that holy environment, that garden of life, that garden of holiness, will flow every good thing. May God grant you the grace to have holy and beautiful families.